Good morning, third grade. So this is Mrs. Juarez. I am the teacher librarian at your school. Uh, today, I'm going to be reading a book called Noah Webster and His Words. Uh, the author is Jerry Chase Ferris and illustrated by Vincent X. Kirsch. So this is our title page. Our title page tells us the title of the book, which is Noah Webster and His Words. Uh, here, the author and the illustrator. And also, here is the publisher, Houghton Mifflin Books for Children. Um, it's a company in Boston and in New York. It was also published in 2012. So that was when this book was uh, printed and made. You can also see that information right here. It says text copyright. There's a C with the circle. And it says 2012. So that's when that book was made. Also, sometimes in a book, um, it'll give you more information. This is the copyright page. Uh, it might give you more information uh, about the book. Here it just tells us the title of the book, the author. Um, it gives us the ISBN number, which is a number that you can use to um, go and buy the book at a store. And it gives us what the book's about, like the topics. So it's about Noah Webster. Here's the date of his birth. He was born in the 1700s, 1758. And um, he's a lexicographer. It's a biography of somebody from the United States. And he was also an educator. Noah Webster always knew he was right. And he never got tired of saying so, even if sometimes he wasn't. He was, he said, full of confidence, which is a noun, a belief that one is right from the very beginning. He looks so funny, huh, with his big head. He was born in 1758 on a farm in West Hartford, Connecticut, when America still belonged to England. And by the time he was 12, he knew how to grow everything from beans and corns to peas and potatoes. His father said Noah would be a fine farmer, following in the footsteps of a long line of Webster farmers. But Noah did not want to be in that long line. He didn't want to be a farmer at all. Look at his face looking at his dad. He really doesn't want to be a farmer. Noah wanted to be a scholar. Uh, a scholar is one who goes to school, a person who knows a lot. He wanted to study Latin and Greek. His father said he could if he did all his work on the farm too. It wasn't long before Noah's father found him with his nose in a book and his work not done. Red haired Noah was red faced with embarrassment, which means shame and confusion. Imagine he's trying to study. That's what he's like hiding that he's doing studying. What are some things that you guys are hiding that you're doing? I don't think it's studying. You guys are probably hiding that you're playing video games or on a phone, but he wanted to study. He wanted to be a scholar. Mr. Webster went to see Noah's teacher, the Reverend Perkins. Reverend Perkins convinced, which is a verb overcame by argument, Mr. Webster that Noah should be in school, not on the farm. So when Noah was 15, he entered Yale, one of the best colleges in the country. There was only one problem. Yale was expensive, uh, which means having a high price or costly. Mr. Webster got a loan on the farm to pay the bill. Noah promised to pay him back. When Noah graduated from Yale in 1778, the Revolutionary War, which had started in 1775, was still going on. What should he do? Join the army, study law, return to farming? He owed his father a lot of money, and he had to get a job fast. He decided he knew enough to be a good teacher. That fall, Mr. Noah Webster, age 19, began teaching school. Like many teachers then, he had no blackboard, no chalk, no pencils or maps. 
He did have lots of students and a few old school books from England, but Noah wanted to teach his students about America. He wanted American school books. He's 19 years old and is a teacher. Wow. I think he must have been pretty smart. In October 1781, King George's soldiers surrendered, which means gave up at Yorktown. The war was over at last. America was free and independent, not controlled by others. That gave Noah an idea. He would write the school books for America, beginning with spelling. I will write the second Declaration of Independence, Noah wrote to a friend, an American spelling book. After all, now that America was free from England, why should Americans spell the way they did in England? For example, in England, plow was spelled P-L-O-U-G-H. Also, Americans were spelling words any way they wanted. So the same word might be spelled 10 different ways. So there's mosquito, mosquito. Look at all the different ways they spell mosquito. Look, mosquito in 10 different places. Noah thought Americans should spell every word the every word the same way every time everywhere this would unite make one the new united states for almost two years noah taught all day and worked on his speller every night when the book was finished the publisher one who prints an author's work of the connecticut current newspaper printed it Noah wanted his new spelling book to look different from other books on the shelves, so he told his printers to put a blue cover on it. That way people could just ask for the blue back speller. The speller cost a lot, 14 cents, but it soared. Now back then 14 cents was a lot of money, which meant flew off the shelves like an American eagle. Noah's book not only taught spelling, but also listed important American dates, towns, and states. At last, in 1783, an American school book. Noah was very happy with this book, but he still had little money because he only received one penny for each copy sold. The printer got the rest. In 1784, his second book was published, A Grammar, Study of Words, Rules for Using Words. That's what grammar means. It was a grammar book. In 1785, his third book was published, a reading book. The printers were getting rich. Noah was not. Noah worried about his bills and he worried about America. There was no president. Each of the 13 states had its own money and made its own rules. Noah was afraid America would fall into 13 pieces. We ought not to think of ourselves as people of one state, he wrote, but as Americans. He decided to go to every state and talk about his books and his ideas. He went north, south, east, and west. He gave his book to teachers and he gave lectures, which is a talk to an audience to everyone. Now is the time. This is the country, Nor Noah roared. Let us establish a national language and government. He liked that part best. He said it often and as loudly as he could. In Philadelphia, Noah met Rebecca Greenleaf. He was soon writing in his diary about the most lovely Rebecca. And before long, they were married. Over the next 10 years, Noah wrote six more school books for children and had several children of his own. He also started a magazine and newspaper so he could tell Americans about their new government. Alas, this turned out to be too much writing, even for Noah Webster. Gosh, he wrote so much. Imagine all that writing. Noah gave up on the magazine and newspaper business. He settled his family in New Haven, Connecticut and wrote more school books. People all over the country were buying his books, especially the blue back speller. And finally, Noah had some money. He also had an idea. He would write a dictionary, which is a book listing words in ABC order, telling what they mean and how to spell them. Two small dictionaries had been printed in America before this, 
but with English spellings, Noah's dictionary would be 100% American, the first American dictionary. He planned to explain every word in the English language, including new American words such as skunk, dime, and tomahawk, which is an Indian hatchet. After all, he said, who knew more about the American word than Noah Webster? And Noah decided he needed to show where every word in English came from. So he studied 20 different languages from Arabic to Italian to Welsh. He read almost every book in the local libraries collecting words for his dictionary. He read almost every book in the Yale University Library. Wow, he read a lot. He started his dictionary in 1807 and 17 years later, he was still writing. He needed more books. He needed the great libraries in Paris and London and Cambridge. In 1824, he took notes and his son, he took his notes and his son and sailed for Europe. A year later with a shaky hand, Noah wrote the meaning of the last word in the English dictionary, zygomatic, related to the cheekbone. How did it feel to be finished at last? It was difficult to hold my pen steady, he said. But after walking about the room for a few minutes, I recovered. Now, Noah needed to read 2,000 pages he had worked on for almost 20 years to be sure there was no mistakes. Oh my gosh, reading all those pages. Next, he needed to find just the right publisher. Last, he needed to take a nap. <laughs> in 1828, when Noah was 70, 70 years old, 70, his American Dictionary of the English Language was published. He gave it to America with these words, to my fellow citizens for their happiness and learning, for their moral and religious elevations and for the glory of my country. Oh. Noah died in 1843 after a long, busy life. But that was not the end of Noah Webster. When the pioneers went west in the early 1800s, Noah's blueback speller was in their covered wagons. When the Civil War ended in 1865, the newly freed slaves learned to read from Noah's speller. Noah's dictionary is the second most popular book printed in English after the Bible. The Bible's the most popular. It is in every library and in most homes, in our schools and our computers, teaching Americans how to spell and how to use and say nearly every word in the English language. Now knows Webster's words did unite America. He was, he always knew he was right. The end. How did you guys like it? Well, I have a surprise for you. Uh, all of you, all of you third graders are going to be getting Webster's Dictionary and Thesaurus. So you guys are gonna be getting this dictionary and it's so cool because it's Webster's. Like we just read about Noah Webster. So this is his dictionary and thesaurus. It has two things. So it's a dictionary, which you know what a dictionary is. It's an alphabetical order. It defines the words, but there's also a thesaurus in the middle of it. So there's gonna be a line in the middle of your dictionary and that's where the thesaurus starts. So thesaurus is a, a book that you can find words and it's going to give you uh, synonyms for those words. Sometimes it gives you antonyms for the words also. So each of you guys is going to get one of these. Um, this is a present to you um, from the Long Beach uh, Public Library Foundation and the Children's Miller uh, Foundation. So these foundations, uh, they they raised some money and they bought every single third grader in uh, Long Beach one of these uh, dictionaries. And the cool part is, is that it's blue and it looks like Noah's blue back speller. So I thought that was really cool. So I hope you guys enjoy this book. Um, use it, look for some words, any type of words that you 
that you can imagine. See if the words are in here and then you can see how they're spelled. You can also see um, the different definitions and, um, and just enjoy the book. All right. Thank you guys for joining me today. Have a great day.